Hello, Finimizers. Welcome to another Finimize Live. My name is Luke. I'm your Finimize analyst and host of today's event, Should You Save Your Cash or Invest? Let's just briefly run through a few housekeeping rules that we usually do. As you're coming in, please fill out the poll. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Tell us where you're tuning in from. And remember to switch to all attendees so everyone can see your messages. It's a 15-minute conversation followed by a 15-minute audience Q&A. We want to hear from you guys. So use the Q&A box to ask a question and if you see a question you like uh, upvote it so it moves to the top that way we can um, get through the most upvoted questions first okay let's kick this off so our event partner for today is Raisin if you don't know Raisin Raisin is UK's it's a UK's free marketplace which connects savers with a range of deposit protected savings accounts with competitive high street beating interest rates say goodbye to multiple logins and paperwork um, apply to open as many savings accounts accounts as you like and manage everything under one roof. And today I'm very excited to have with me the man behind Raisin, Kevin Mountford, the co-founder. Kevin uh, is an experienced financial service professional with experience in the finance sector spanning five decades, including 19 years of senior management experience at holding senior positions with Halifax, Bank of Scotland, Birmingham Midshires, and Cheshire Building Society. Kevin was also head of banking at moneysupermarket.com, where he was instrumental in promoting cards, mortgages, and savings. First things first, how are you doing today, Kevin? Yeah, I'm really good. Thanks for the intro. Um, obviously, the five decades, I must have started from junior school, but never mind. <laughs> Well, Kevin, we've got a lot to get through today, so I want to dive straight in. Um, so Ray Dalio is obviously famous for saying, you know, cash is trash, but it seems like right now it's anything but trash. How much would you say on average do you think the average 25 to 35-year-old should be allocating to cash in their universe, their investment portfolio? Um, yeah, I mean, just picking up on the, on the comment, to be fair, um, Ray is the founder of one of the largest hedge funds in the world. And I think he's got personal wealth of about $20 billion. So you'd expect he knows what he's uh, on about. But I think it's important to put context in it because um, over time, you, you know, investments prove their worth um, in terms of equities. But cash plays a really important part. But over recent years, we've had very low interest rates and we've had um, high inflation. So the idea of cash is trash is very much on the fact that the value gets eroded. But here in the UK, we're quite risk adverse. And I think cash plays maybe a more important part than it does in many other markets. Um, and I think that was epitomized back in 2012 when the regulators introduced what was known as the retail distribution review. And advisors then looked at kind of cash as an asset class. So I think from that point of view, um, you know, it's playing a, an increasingly important part. And as you say now, after 12 successive interest rate rises, then the value you get in cash is far greater. In terms of, you know, how much people should be putting away, it's very difficult to generalize. Um, we all are, are in different circumstances. And I was looking at some ONS data, and albeit it's 12 months out of date, it, it was saying that on average, 25 to 34 year olds only have £3,500. Um, but if you break that down, that maybe represents 60% of that age group. But to put it into perspective, there's also 13% of that age group that apparently have got around about 50Ks worth of savings. So it's very, very difficult. Um, I think just on that point, Raisin carried out some research um, around the time of the pandemic, and we were seeing the savings ratio higher than maybe it's ever been. So the amount that we save versus amount that we earn. And that isn't surprising in terms of the fact we weren't spending it as much. But I also think there's a realisation we hadn't got enough money squirreled away for emergency. And so subsequently, um, we are now seeing that people's attitudes very different towards savings. And, and it's a good job we did because with the... Um, with the living crisis we faced, a lot of that money will have been used to help as a buffer during these difficult times. Yeah, 
I completely agree, Kevin. Um, and and having that dry powder on hand uh, for multiple different uses, you know, if you were made redundant because there was so much uncertainty in the pandemic, or you know, if you wanted to buy cheap assets that were on discount sales. So yeah, I think uh, you definitely. It is very hard to say because everybody has their own individual circumstances. But I think having an allocation to cash, particularly now with the rates that they're yielding, and that brings me to my next question of what are the kinds of returns that investors can sort of make with cash right now? The maximum. Um, if they were to put money with with raise them, well, again, it depends um, what kind of products you're putting money in. Typically, in the market, the longer you can lock money away for, the bigger the return. Um, fixed term bonds or deposits are very much based on swap rates in the market. So, basically, what does the market anticipate rates are going to look like in two, three, four, five years? Um, but we're seeing a fairly unique position at the moment where the banks can actually raise deposits and put that that money on deposit with the Bank of England and make a return. So the spreads that they're making purely from depositing money is a positive, and that's the first time for a long time. And that's why we're seeing increased rates on particularly easy access. So you can now get somewhere 320, 330 on, on easy access products. Going back to what I said earlier on um, fixed term, then you can get around about what four four percent plus on a one year bond. In fact, at Raisin, we've got a very competitive four point three percent from a bank called Zenith. And if you wanted to lock away on a slightly lower term, then on nine months we've got a market leading four point two five percent from a bank called Ishbank. I also think for a lot of people, um, notice accounts can play a really important part. They seem to disappear on the back of the rise of things like instant access, easy access. But for somebody that wants to take a more disciplined approach to savings, then they're a good idea because you have to consider before you actually make the decision to withdraw. And we've currently got an Investec product uh, exclusive um, paying 3.45% for just 32 days notice. So you can see how a product like that can kind of um, work um, in parallel or complement things like easy access. Going at the other end of the scale, things like a tandem product, 4.6% for five year. <clears throat> On the face of it, you might say, well, 4.6 at five year versus four, 4.2 at one year, there's not enough premium. But the outlook is that interest rates will start to reduce end of this year into next year. So for anybody who can afford to lock some money away over the period of that product, you are going to get a greater return. My only word of warning on that is the interest um, allowance that we have. So the, the amount of tax you pay on interest, it's £500 for um, high rate payers and £1,000 for basic rate payers. If you're in a product like that and you've got a sizable deposit, you're going to go over those thresholds. So try and look at a product where possibly you can draw the interest on an annual basis. And then obviously that goes into your tax return. So I think it's all about um, looking at your own individual requirements, ideally having a mixed portfolio. But the main thing is there's lots of apathy and inertia, and many of us are failing to get the best return that we possibly could. Yeah, so, you know, you mentioned this inertia, um, Kevin, and so why do you think in the general banking sector, those deposit beaters, and for anybody that's not aware of what that term means, is basically when, you know, central banks raise their interest rates, how much do uh, banks raise their rates in response to that? Um, you know, surely they're losing market share, a business as a result of challenger banks. So why aren't the more traditional banks actually moving in line and, and raising that, do you think, Kevin? Well, the simple answer is they want to make some margin. So... <laughs> Or any bluntly, I mean, at the end of the day, and I've worked in the banking sector, we used to rub our hands every time there was a base rate change, up or down, because you pass it on to the borrower in full and pretty much straight away, and to the saver to a lesser degree and generally to slower rates. So every time you do that, it manipulates the margin, particularly if you've got a sizable back book of savers. So that's why the big banks um, tend not to be as competitive as the rest of the market. That there's also very different players, trade finance um, banks, private banks, et cetera. They're in a different market. They've got different spreads. 
based on um, lending and, and um, savings products, investments, et cetera. But the important thing is, so the biggest amount of cash we as the UK save are still with the big four, five banks and building societies. Um, and I can understand that from possibly on an easy access um, where you, you run that in parallel with your current account, that's fine. And if that's your kind of rainy day money, that's okay. But I think for anybody who's got a bit more cash, they owe it to themselves to kind of move that around. And very often, and again, if you look at the range of banks we have on Raisin, there's the likes of an Investec, which is more household name, I guess. Um, you've got lots of challenges on there, the likes of Paragon, um, Tandem. They'll be what we call kind of exotic, so they tend to be overseas banks. There's some building sites, um, credit unions. So if there is a particular type of provider, then lots of choice. But at the end of the day, the important thing to consider that at £85,000 under the FSCS, Financial Services Compensation Scheme, you are covered just as much under these lesser known brands as you are with the big banks. And as you said at the outset, the beauty of, of our platform is one single application. You're then empowered to move your money around as and when you need to. Thank you. That, that uh, one, one stop shop. Um, Kevin, you mentioned the different uh, time periods in which uh, clients can basically uh, invest their cash with Raisin. Uh, so on that topic, let's say something, a life event happens and you needed to yank that cash out, but you'd put it in for one year time period. Um, is, there, is there a penalty uh, for early withdrawal or anything like that charges? There's rarely any charges. I mean, there are normally two situations where you can break a fixed bond. And that is on death or financial hardship. So they are supported with documented evidence and they are captured within the terms and conditions. But I think with any product, it's important to check out the terms and conditions. We talked about things like easy access. Some of the leading rates have some limitations on things like number of withdrawals. So I, I think in, in any situation, you should always be conscientious enough to check the terms and conditions. But generally speaking, on fixed term bonds, there, there can be obviously adjustment of interest because you haven't put the money in as long as you said you would. But there are normally only two circumstances in which the bank would allow you to break that um, that that uh, product. Okay, all right. And then, and Kevin, you were saying earlier about um, you know rates that you can get on returns are based on swap rates, and you know to lock that in if you want a high rate. So I guess my question would be then, how long do you think this opportunity is going to last? Uh, is your medium term view on rates that we're going to start to are we at the peak? Do you think we're going to start to see rates coming off? Start seeing a cutting maybe into this back half of of, of this year? Well, I mean, I think, you know, it's been a real, without kind of being overly sympathetic to central banks, I think it's been a really tough balancing act. We've got fairly unique economic situation, um, particularly as we've come out of lockdown. Um, we've then got Brexit uh, and we've all got the dreadful events going on over in Ukraine. Um, and the global high inflation, central banks, one of the main, if possibly only levers it has is interest rates. And that's why, as I say, we've seen successive central banks increase rates. So European Central Bank, Bank of England, the Fed, et cetera. Um, but on the other side of the coin, we've got a very weak global economy. Um, and so the danger is there is that interest rates get pushed to an eye, uh, highs whereby it impacts the economy. And we talk about possibly going into recession or not, um, but I think there is some positivity on the on the horizon. Um, the IMF recently said that they see rates going to pre-COVID um, levels. Um, we heard Jeremy Hunt saying inflation could be at 2.9% in the UK by the end of the year. Now, even if that's a tad optimistic, I think the various metrics are showing that it will start to fall and start rapidly. And I do think that there is nervousness at the Bank of England to raise rates much further than they currently are for now. I think they want to see how things play out. So at the last MPC meeting, there were seven members voted for the rate rise, two to keep it as it was. 
Um, so it'll be interesting what the next set of inflationary figures looks like. Um, and then on top of that, the next MPC meeting is, uh, I think, May the 12th. But if I was to put £5 on a decision, I would suggest they may just keep it at 425 Now, the longer term outlook, end of this year into 2024 and beyond, is that rates will settle down. Whatever the new norm is, I'm not so sure. I think 2 3% possibly for the foreseeable future. But the important thing is, going back to the point I mentioned before, um, we've got really competitive market. We've seen lots of banks, for instance, ones that we've introduced and raised that most people have never heard of. They're all keen to diversify. That's something that the regulators are looking for. It's something that the market's demanding. As long as there's competition, then rates will continue to be competitive. But it's important that we don't all believe that suddenly rates are going to continue to go through the roof. And I think sometimes the media portrays that kind of image. And that's why we've got a lot of people going into easy access, because at the end of the day, they want the money to stay fluid so they can lock it in as and when required. But I think now, if I was looking long term and, and I had the available cash and I wanted to get a balanced portfolio, I'd be looking medium long term because I think interest rates will start to peak and then dip. And if you're getting a 450, 460, five year bond that's actually paying you um, annual income, then that's not a bad product to have as part of your portfolio. And we're going to dive straight into the Q&A. Um, we've got some good questions for you so far, so I'm going to pull that up now. Uh, the first question that's got the most upvotes is from Jason, and he says, is it important to put away savings in a ISA allowance first before saving in an easy access savings account as it is tax-free? Um, so I think over time, ISAs have definitely proven the worth. And I think people who've built up an ISA portfolio can very much you know, benefit from switching that around. The industry tends to pay lower rates on ISAs. And they will argue that operationally, it's a bit more onerous. I don't really believe that in this day and age, but it's a way of justifying the difference between a, a vanilla product versus an ISA product. Um, bear in mind what I said earlier, that there is an allowance currently on interest rates, uh, sorry, on the interest you earn, um, and and that's at, you know five hundred to thousand pound depending on your tax status. And for most people, based on the average savings I've mentioned, they won't be anywhere near those thresholds. So you could argue make the most of the top rate, regardless of where it's from. Um, but as part of a portfolio, I think ISAs can play a part, particularly with stocks and shares, because over time, you know, five, ten, fifteen years, your returns tend to be higher. Um, so I, I'd certainly look at ISA options, but at the moment for the majority of people, based on average savings, then I would go for the highest rate. Um, and if that sits out of an ISA, so be it. Okay, perfect. Thanks, thanks for that, Kevin. I just want to remind anybody that's on, on the uh, webinar today to uh, put their questions in the Q&A box um, and keep them coming through. Um, so... Kevin, uh, we've got another question that's come through uh, in the Q&A box, and it says, um, do you think the end of the US dollar is coming in the history major reserve changed always in the long term? What, what it, Do you think it's the death of the dollar? Are you, do you sit in that camp, or do you think it's overhyped and, and not the case? Um, I was looking at an interesting Twitter feed, um, and I can't remember who, who was the author of the original piece, but... It was very much about the end of cash per se. And I've been hearing this for a long, long time. And obviously, you know, hard currencies play a significant part in, in the global economy. There's lots of talk about um, cryptocurrencies, et cetera. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think your attitude to these depends on many, many different factors. Um, but going back to the original comment is cash is trash. You know, money certainly isn't in whatever form it takes. Um, but no, I, I don't think that we're going to see massive material changes. Certainly not. You know, if I've been in this for five decades, then maybe in five decades time, the world will be very different. But cash has been around for a long time. Hard currencies like the dollar, the pound, etc. play an important part. 
and I don't see any significant changes, certainly in medium term. Okay, Kevin, I've got another question that I wanted to ask. Um, in the UK, there seems to be a bit of an obsession about getting onto the housing ladder. Um, are, are you seeing lots of demand for raise and to save for this purpose? And uh, a follow-on from that would be, what are some of the other uses from your customers that are, are seeing them opening up raise and accounts with you? So I, I think the short answer is, I do think that people uh, maintain a kind of jam jar mentality. So they squirrel money away or save money away for specific things. In terms of the housing market, then first time buyers play a huge important part in, in that sector. Um, I think something like 25%, if not more, of, of house transactions are first time buyers. We did some research recently that said in the um, 25 to 34 year old group, around about 25% of those that we, um, we, we asked are starting to turn the back on the housing market, possibly because of the um, the cost of the average house. They see it now and impossible to save up enough of a deposit. So if, for instance, the average is, say, 300K, then for a 5% deposit, by my workings, that's about 15K. And um, that particular group were deciding to spend the money on holidays and things or whatever. So I think it does play an important part. And actually... From 2006 to 2021, average house price in the UK grew by 70%. Now, I'm not saying they'll do that again, but when we start thinking about long-term investment, bricks and mortar in the UK play an important part. So there's no doubt that people are using the likes of, of Raisin to put money away for a deposit. And if we look at the average balances across our platform, then that would be hard to, to kind of believe. Um, but if it's not a house, I do think that people save for things like, you know, a wedding, a car, even a holiday. So these are big expense items that you're not just going to get out of, you know, your, your monthly salary. So it is important to get into good saving habits and particularly if you've got a, a goal in mind. OK, great. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin, for that that insight. Um, we've got we've got another We've got a few questions coming through here. I'm going to take one uh, that came through actually on the chat. And it said, if you're already registered with multiple accounts, can these still be brought in under the raise and umbrella? Or do you have to register from scratch? If you've got, no, if you've got multiple accounts um, having interacted direct with the banks, then you can't just port those into the raise and environment. But if you open up a raise and account, then there's no reason you couldn't withdraw the money from those products, depending on the type of products, i.e. it's not a fixed term, um, and then you open up a raising account. We, we, we cap every um, deposit into a banking institute at 85K. So if there is anybody that's got way beyond that, one application, they can spread the money accordingly. <coughs> Excuse me. So they're keeping it under the FSCS limits. And we do have some real high net worths They've got multiple accounts with us. So you would need to open an account with Raisin. That, that is a very quick process. Um, and then once you've done that, then you're empowered to move your money around accordingly. And within Raisin, you can then own multiple accounts. Okay. All righty. Um, I think that answers that question quite well. Um, I've got another question here also. I'll I almost made the mistake of putting over my allowance in an ISA this year when SS, Lisa, and cash ISA, et cetera. What, what are the penalties if I miscalculate and put too much away? Um, well, I'm, I'm guessing if you're at that level, you, you're likely to be in a position where you do a self-assessment. Um, you know, in, in public, I'm not going to share, I guess, my true thoughts in terms of how likely it is that you'll get found out. But at the end of the day, I think you should do the right thing and then adjust it in your subsequent tax return. Um, because obviously, it, it, you know, you, you shouldn't conduct any kind of fraudulent activity. And basically, if you oversubscribe against a certain allowance, you can fall foul of that. So I'd come clean and just declare it in your next tax return. Okay, all righty. Um, and then we've got a more market-related question here. I'm happy to also assist in answering this, but I'd like to get your insights, uh, Kevin. It says, could you please explain why the market's panicked as a result of Quasi Quarting's mini-budget? 
Yeah, um, that seems a long time ago now. I, and, and going back to what I said earlier about the balance between inflation and the economy, I can fully understand what the um, what the objective was at that particular time. But the markets hate anything that creates nervousness. And at the time, I think it was recognised inflation was the primary challenge that was faced across the globe. And subsequently, there was a number of um, decisions taken on the back of that many budget um, that um, effectively detracted from, from that situation. And as I say, the, the market reacted accordingly. Thankfully, um, we've steadied the ship now. And I do think that particularly if we get into the second half of this year, we are hopefully going to see some signs that give us some real optimism going into 2024 and beyond. I just I agree with what you're saying, Kevin. I'm very glad the, st the ship has been steadied. But I would, I'm going to say something controversial now, but I would actually say that some serious questions need to be asked at the Bank of England, uh, that they weren't aware of the size and the nature of these LDIs and the, the risk of sort of these VAR shocks, which are sort of risk tools that uh, companies are supposed to have in place to stress test when we see these interest rate movements. I think the plumbing, um, the fact that pensions could put collateral with the Bank of England also didn't allow them to tap into liquidity that they desperately needed. Um, but I think the Bank of England shouldn't be engaged, they shouldn't have been engaging in quantitative tightening um, actively. And because the ECB and the US, uh, the Fed were not doing it, they were doing it passively, they're letting bonds roll over, whereas actually here in the UK, the Bank of England was going into the market and actively uh, selling gilts. So, uh, you know, it, it put a lot of pressure uh, on on those on those treasury those guilt yields and I think Liz Trust is to blame certainly but some serious questions need to also be asked of the Bank of England so I think it was like three stools on a chair uh, the three legs on a stool it was the Bank of England uh, it was short sellers hedge funds really whacking those LDRs and I think uh, obviously the market freaking out about that policy being inflationary and unfunded tax cuts from the budget um, Kevin we're going to ask another question here uh, we've got two more so Lola's asked when inflation reduces back to two three percent is a possible likely for prices of food, clothes, etc., to reduce to? Um, short answer is yes, because effectively those items are captured in the bank of uh, the basket of goods that assess the inflationary figures. Um, so they, they do have to come down for those um, numbers to be achieved. I, I think if you look at the inflation figure, the, the, the worrying thing and annoying thing is that the, the likes of food the inflation rate against those particular products have been way above the, the 10 percent that we're seeing at the moment. And that's why I think it's been really difficult for households across the country, because the one thing is we can't we might be able to turn a back on luxury goods and to some extent elements of clothing, et cetera. But we certainly can't when it comes to, to food. So it goes hand in hand that if inflation gets down to that two to three percent, then the likes of food costs will come down accordingly. And. I, um, I, I kind of use my um, my wife's shopping experience as a bit of a litmus test. And she came back yesterday and on a particular item, I think it's a jar of coffee. She said it had gone down like two pound from where it was. And there seems to be lots of offers now that we hadn't seen. But I think with shopping for food, the same as anything else, you got to shop. You have literally got to shop around. Make sure you're getting the best bargain you can because we don't want the money in the pockets of the retailer or the banks. So we owe it to ourselves to make our cash work as, as hard as we possibly can. Be with you, Kevin. I've been shocked at some of the price tags. I'm, I'm still waiting for, I'm hoping not. it's not just uh, jam and it's a few other products that also start to reduce. Um, we're going to finish off with two questions uh, and then we're going to wrap things up. So we've got a question that's come through saying, is this a good account for a young people uh, age 17? As in the raisin account? Uh, yes, I would or assume that's generally... what the question. Yeah, I, I would assume yes. Yeah, I, th I think that um, we get we need to get into good habits and and quite a number of accounts. There are there is a minimum age before you can open that up, and generally they they'd be eighteen. There's lots of different accounts across the market for for younger savers, and I think going back to what I said earlier about good habits, 
Um, you know, I've got friends of mine now that have got kids and they'll usually say, look, instead of buying something, why don't you give us some cash that we can put into the individual savings account? And, you know, this will be parents and grandparents. And, and then that brings you into good habits when you start working yourself or, or even as a student, if you possibly got any spare cash as a student. But, um, yeah, I, I think there are many different accounts out there and get into good saving habits. But generally, um, there are different accounts depending on your age group until you get to the, the, the age of 18. Great. That's, that's fantastic, Kevin. I think it's, I couldn't agree more with you starting them off young, uh, starting people off young and getting into those, uh, those savvy saving habits from a young age. So we're going to finish off with the last question. And it's, it's also kind of a little bit market related, but we saw with the SVB, the, the banking crisis, how that blew up. Um, and I think there's a bit of nervousness about how people's, you know, of the deposits guaranteed. I know in the UK, I think it's maximum 85 K. So I guess my question is how does one deposit, protect their deposit if they have more than the maximum 85k on hand that they'd like to invest mm -hmm. would they just open multiple accounts within that bank that they use through raisin or just run us through that very briefly um just firstly i mean the likes of svb and credit suisse they've obviously created some nervousness particularly amongst um kind of retail and business customers but i think the situation is now very different than it was back in 2008 I think to be fair to regulators around the globe, they've stabilized the market. It doesn't have the systemic effect that it would have done. You think how quickly here in the UK, the SVB situation was resolved. But bottom line is um, 85,000 pounds, as you say, for a single account, 170,000 for a joint account, you are protected under the uh, financial services compensation scheme. I think earlier today, Andrew Bailey, um, Governor of the Bank of England muted the idea of increasing those thresholds again to boost um, confidence because the last thing you want is a run on the bank where effectively we get nervous and we all take our money out because then clearly when the balance sheet collapses, the bank goes under. So I think the situation is nowhere near as severe as, as it was. I think it's proven that it can look after itself. All the safety guards have been put in place. But what you need to do is ensure you spread any cash that you've got. And I certainly wouldn't have 80, more than 85K with any single institution. And that comes back again to one of the real benefits of a platform like Raisin. It allows you to spread the money around, assuming you've got the, the wealth that necessitates um, that spread. But even if it isn't, you can come away with a mixed portfolio and maximize your returns by choosing different providers and different products. Yeah, I think that's that's very important to alleviate any of that counterparty uh, credit risk and, and not putting all your eggs in one basket. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us today. Honestly, it's been super insightful. We've discussed markets, views on rates. We've discussed you know how valuable cash is at the moment. I've personally found it enlightening, and I hope everybody else has too. Super informative. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate it. Thanks very much for asking me and um, hope everybody has a great afternoon and a great weekend. Fantastic. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate it. Bye.